was thinking about a guy I heard preaching a number of years ago called Carl Martin. He's a, a guy who was leading a big church in Scotland at the time called Central Church in Edinburgh. And uh, he was speaking at, at a conference I was at. And he was talking about how not long before that he had been at a, a big event with Brother Young. You remember the, the Heavenly Man? Some of you will have heard of him. His book, The Heavenly Man, was famous. He's a Chinese guy, a Chinese pastor who was, uh, has been persecuted, has been imprisoned, has, uh, sees miracles. He has more miracles before breakfast than most of us <laughs> see in a lifetime. All those people that you're just like, is this really true? And then you, you hear him speak and you're like, there's something so powerful on this guy. And Brother Yun was speaking at this big event and Carl Martin was there with his wife. And at the end of it, Brother Yun did an appeal. It was through a... It was through an interpreter because he didn't speak English very well. And, and uh, the first appeal was, uh, uh, I'm, okay, I'm not going to do the Chinese accent because I, I, I know what, the, let's pretend the interpreter had a Northern Irish accent. Anyone who wants to come to Jesus, come to the front. And everybody streamed to the front. And, and, uh, and then the next one was, uh, I want all pastors and leaders to come to the front. And, and Carl Martin said his wife, Ollie, looked at him and he sat there. And she said, pastors and leaders, Go to the front. And he said, I'm not doing it. And she said, go to the front. And he said, look, I have been at so many of these conferences where they've invited pastors and leaders to the front. Nothing ever happens. And I come back feeling dejected. I come back feeling, well, that was a waste of time. I come back feeling stupid. I'm not going to. And she kept nudging him, go to the front, go to the front. And he kept going, I'm not going to the front. I've been disappointed so many times. I'm not going to the front. And she's nudging, go to the front. Go to the front. And eventually, just to like, Keep her quiet. He gets up and he takes two steps to start walking to the front. And then just as he does that, Brother Young says, and anyone who battles lust and pornography, come to the front. <laughs> and Carl Martin says he had this moment where he's, he's in suspended animation, where he has a decision to make. And my, I, my heart bled for him at that moment. My heart also laughed at him. Uh, and he had this moment of, do I slink back to my seat? Or do I keep walking? And he's like, I've got all these members of my church, like further down the steps, who are all going to be looking, going, we knew there was something. You know, we all, I told you. And he had this moment where he had to decide, am I going to push through the shame or am I going to stay where I am? And he said, he walked to the front and he says, as he walked past his church members, he could feel them staring at him. But he went down and Brother Young prayed for him and he, God deeply, deeply touched his life that night. And he talked about how past pain and regret and things not working out and, uh, and, and cynicism and all of that stuff can sometimes stop us from pressing forward into what God wants to do with us. When you've had disappointment, when you've had pain, when you've been around the block a few times, when you've seen it all, when you've bought the t-shirt, the sweatshirt and the baseball cap, you can get a little bit cynical. I've been doing this stuff for a long time. I've been in church as a believer for 34, 34 years now this year. And I've seen it all and I've done it all. And sometimes I find cynicism creeping in. Sometimes I just kind of roll my eyes a little bit. And yet there's this sense, I believe, where God would want to say to us, I want to birth something new. I want to do something new. But your disappointment will stop you and your cynicism will keep you contained. And your pain and your past experiences from your old church or from that old relationship or from that old betrayal or from, from the prayer not being answered, if you cling on to that, that will stop you from fully entering the new thing that I want to do. And you will settle for less than God has made available to you. And Isaiah 54 that we're looking at today, and we're going to look at, this is part one. I plan to preach it all today. Um, but this morning I decided to split it into two. You're welcome. Um, we're going to look at it in two parts. I'm going to look at just one verse this morning. But God's people are in a low place. The people of God, the people he created to be his own special possession, to be a light to the nations, to carry his presence and his glory, to display the radiance and wonder of all he is. 
His people are in a low place. They're actually in exile in Babylon. Instead of being a light to the nations, they became inward looking and they became exclusive and they got sinful and they began, they wanted to be like the other nations. They lost their true identity. They forgot that they were God's special possession. They were his people and they were meant to carry his glory. And when the church forgets her identity, they always try to look like the world around them. And it never ends up well. When the church forgets her true identity as the bride and the body of Christ, called and set apart by God, they start trying to mimic the culture around them and God lifts his hand of blessing and protection off them and his favor. And that's what happens to Israel here. And they get carried off into exile for 70 years. 70 years. Seven zero. That's a long time. And into the midst of this, a prophet called Isaiah speaks. And he begins to speak about something shifting, something changing. Look at verse 1 with me. Sing, barren woman, you who never bore a child, burst into song, shout for joy. You who were never in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband, says the Lord. So God compares his people here to a barren woman. The people who were meant to be fruitful, the people who were meant to reproduce themselves as a light to the nations and carry the kingdom of God and the and, 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 and nature of God and the glory of God to the nations. He, he calls them a barren woman. In those days, barrenness was a, a very uncomfortable thing. So much of that culture depended on producing offspring. If you read the Old Testament at all, you'll know that. Especially you wanted to produce, produce male heirs to carry the family line, to, to keep the land in the family. And so barrenness was seen as something that was very much looked down upon in that culture. In fact, it was often seen as a, a curse from God. Just as an aside here, and this is just an aside, I, I'm very aware that when we talk about these things, it's a, it's a sensitive issue. I'm very aware that we live at, in a community like this and, and, and there's people who would love to have children and it's just not happening for them yet. I have dear friends who are trying to have kids and every time I meet up with them, I ask them how things going because we have a good relationship and they just say it's, it's not happening yet. I've had family members that that's happened with. And so there's, I'm, I'm very aware of the sensitivities of that. And I'm very conscious that sometimes when we're in church, we organize family days. And I, can I just say to you, when we say Hope Family Day, we mean this family. Yeah. We mean your brothers and sisters, your fathers and mothers in Christ. That's what we talk about. But I, I'm very conscious of, of just people who can't have children, people who haven't yet had children, but they can, but it's just not happening. People who don't want to have children, and, and all of the brokenness of that, I, I just, I want to acknowledge that. And I want to just say, let's all of us just be sensitive around that. Let's not walk on eggshells. I don't mean that at all. But let's just not project what we think is normal onto everybody else. I did it last week. I was in Tesco. And I bumped into a girl that I went to school with. And I, I had this assumption she had two kids. And I said, so you have two kids? And she said, no, I don't have any. And it was just that moment, as she said it, I could hear it was tinged with sadness. And I walked away feeling stupid. And so that's the reason I say that here, that, that while we don't want to walk on eggshells, let's never make assumptions. Parents, when your kids get married, let's not make assumptions that they're going to produce grandchildren within the first year or two. Okay? And I, I just I say that as, as, as a pastor who just has seen how difficult that can be for people and, 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 and how, how much stress and strain that can put in families. And, and, and just one other thing on, on a lighter note, let's lift it here a little bit. Um, folks, let's never assume that somebody is pregnant either, okay? <laughs> if you've ever said to somebody, are you expecting, and they say no, that is one of the most awkward. <laughs> Can I or not? <laughs> She's like, you've got the bike now. Does it matter if I say no? Um, many, six years ago, seven years ago, we were in holidays in Lanzarote and the place we went, it was an Airbnb and it wasn't the nicest 
place development would ever stay in, let's just say and there was a few roughs around the place. And, but Becky had been working really hard, uh, working out really hard before this holiday and, and uh, was feeling just really like she'd got into shape and she was feeling really good about herself. And, and uh, she was in the pool one day and uh, there was these, uh, this family from the south um, who were probably from inner city Dublin somewhere and uh, the wee girl who was probably, what, about six or seven at the time just looked at Becky in the pool one day. And I can't do accents, so I'm not going to try. But she just looked at Becky and went, so were you expecting a baby? <laughs> and Becky just looked down and just went, all the work I've put in, all the work I've put in, you know. And, uh, and that's, that's, what I, that's what I get. But, uh, yeah, let's not ask people if they're expecting, unless we have literally seen the scan itself. Okay. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, Israel were supposed to reproduce. They were supposed to be fruitful. They were supposed to flourish and thrive and multiply across the earth. But here they are stranded in exile. They're contained. They're unfruitful. They're basically barren. They're not physically barren, but it's been used as a metaphor to describe their spiritual condition. They're empty. They're desolate. They're unfruitful. They're not reproducing. They're not carrying the life of God to the nations. They're just barely existing. And deep down, all of them know this is not the way God intended it. This is not the way it's supposed to be. But this has become their reality. And it's not for a week or two. Seventy years, this is how they're living. And I think barrenness is a picture in our own lives of those areas where things aren't working as they should be. Those areas in our lives where things are just not working like they should be working. Those places in our relationships, in our marriage, in our jobs, in our finances, where things should be going one way and we're doing our best, but things just aren't working. You know, we were created for fruitfulness. The very first thing God told Adam and Eve was this. Be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth. We were created for fruitfulness. We were created to multiply. We were created to increase. And so when there's no fruitfulness in our lives, when there's no growth in our lives, when there's no increase, it's because something is not working the way it should be working. And we're prevented from enjoying the fullness of the life and joy and hope and all that God purposed for us. As a church here in Hope and as individual followers of Jesus, God created you for fruitfulness. He expects fruitfulness. There should be growth. You've been growing since the day you were born. You've been increasing and stretching since the day you were born. So there's been physical increase. But he also wants to see increase spiritually. He wants to see increase emotionally, mentally. He wants to see increase in every aspect. He wants to see you reproduce who he is in you and other people there should be fruitfulness and growth and transformation but sometimes that's not the case because we all go through barren seasons we all go through dry places we all go through times when things are tougher than usual and some of you are in that right now where it just feels like it's relentless and where you're weary and you're tired and nothing is lifting and shifting and you feel like you're in a fruitless barren season and you know that things just aren't working right but that is not your normal condition your normal condition is meant to be fruitfulness you know when I was a kid growing up we had an apple tree out the back and how did I know it was an apple tree because every year there were apples on it and if I would have went out and somebody told me that was an apple tree and year after year there were no apples on it I would have had to deduce one of two things one it's not an apple tree or two there's something not right with it there's something at the core of that tree that's not right it's got disease there's there's parasites on there's something not right that that apple tree is not producing the way it should be and it's the same in our lives and it's the same in our church if we are God's people and we're called to be fruitful we're called to make disciples Matthew 28 we're called to reach people we're called to grow we're called to increase and year after year after year we're not doing that there's something fundamentally wrong at the heart at the core of who we are and as we look at the church around the world in the global south it's reproducing as fruitful 
In the Middle East, it's reproducing as fruitful. South America, Africa, the East, reproducing as fruitful. We look at the West. At best, it's trying to hold on to what it has and at worst, it's in decline. And it's because there's something fundamentally wrong at the heart of the church in the West. That somehow we have lost something of our dependence on Christ and our fidelity to his word. (coughs) When churches, and particularly as the statistics keep coming out, the mainline churches are hemorrhaging tens of thousands of members every year. Somebody needs to look and go, the apple tree isn't an apple tree. You can call it whatever you want, but there's something fundamentally wrong. We need to diagnose the problem. And you know what? Here in Hope, we are fruitful. And by God's grace, we are fruitful. We have seen growth. We have seen people come to faith in Christ. We have seen an increase in God's presence among us. We have seen people rededicate their lives. We have seen a growth and depth of relationships and friendships. We have seen growth in our online following. There's so many great things happening right now. And I am so grateful. I am so thankful. And I am so deeply appreciative to God for all he's done and all he's going to do. But I'm also finding myself increasingly burdened that we're not fruitful enough. I'm finding myself increasingly burdened that many of my salvation stories are old stories, not new stories. I'm finding myself increasingly burdened that if we weren't here tomorrow, that many of the people wouldn't give a rip because we don't impact this community. And I know we're starting to make inroads. I know we're starting to try. But I'm just telling you what my burden is. My burden is that there's a lack of fruitfulness. Yes, there is fruit. It's not that we're fruitless, we're not dead. There's just not enough fruit. There's not enough people coming to faith in Jesus. And I really believe that we're moving into a season where God is saying, I will give you more fruit if you will go for it. Because this is not what I created Hope Church to be. And I know that's that's not just my desire. I know that's the burden of your hearts. That this is a church that longs to see the lost coming to know Jesus. And sometimes we just don't know how to do it. And we're saying, God, show us. Sometimes we're going, Lord, I just don't know where to start. I don't know the words to say. But I believe if that is a cry of your heart, God will honor that. And he will bring greater fruitfulness into our church and into our lives. We're not barren. I am not saying that by any means. But we're not as fruitful as we could or should be. And so I guess this message on on part two, which I'll preach, is a prophetic call for us to desire more, more fruit in our lives, in our church, in our community. And if there's any barrenness, that God would break the barrenness and that he would fill it with new life. That we wouldn't just settle for what we have and where we are. You see, one of the things that we're, we, we, we love to say is, how's things? Great. Actually, we don't say great. We say grand. Decent. Not too bad. Surviving. Getting by. It'll do. Good enough. And most of us just settle for good enough. And, and in one sense, that's okay. But, and, and if you were to say to me, how hope's going, I'd say, great, you know, it's going well. It's going good, you know. This, this is really good. What we have here is really good. I love it. Don't hear me wrong here, guys. I love this. Yeah. I love it. God has been so good. His presence is increasing among us. We're full every week. We've got wonderful worship. We preach the word. We've got great communities developing. We've got small groups. We've got, we've got so much going on. And it is so good and I'm so grateful but the thing is this that when something is good it's really easy to go it's good enough that let's just keep this Amen. let's just maintain what we have here and you know what I would love that this is a dream this is fantastic a couple of hundred people in the room people loving Jesus loads of kids down. this is wonderful And it would be so easy for us to go, it's good enough. I love this. 
But as much as I love this, you know what I can't stand? That there are thousands of people who live within a one mile radius of this church who don't know Jesus Christ and who have never heard the gospel. Yeah. I can't, st- as much as I love this, I hate that. Yeah. I hate it. I hate that there's people who have heard a religious perversion of the gospel but have never heard the real gospel of Jesus Christ and seen it properly expressed. I hate that. So I love this and I don't want to do away with this, but I hate that. And so it's not about getting rid of this and going after that. It's about keeping this and going after that. It's about saying, thank you, God, for what you've done. This is wonderful. We are so grateful. But we believe that there's more. Because I believe that God can't stand it either. God loves this. But he hates that there's lots of people going to hell within a mile of this church. He hates that. He sent his son for those people in every area within a mile radius of this church and further afield. And he loves this, but he hates that and so like I said it's not that we stop this but it's that we begin to cry out to God for fruitfulness it's that we begin to say God we love what we have and we're so grateful but Lord we want more we want more we're believing for more beyond our walls we're going to stretch we're going to reach beyond our walls and boundaries and we'll get to that in part two but as I as I prayed this week I felt I felt the Lord rebuke me in one sense because I was saying, God, I love what we have. I don't want to lead a big church. I, I, honestly, 10 years ago, I did. I, I just don't anymore. You know, we had friends in Dublin who had 9 or 11 kids. I can never remember. Cora Burke, how many did they have? 9, 11, 10? We'll leave them at 10. That was chaos. The more kids, the hard, you know, the messier and the more chaos. I, I, I love us. I don't want to lead a big church. But the Lord rebuked me and said, Craig, if you stick with that attitude, I will let you lead a very small church soon. (laughs) If you have that attitude, if that is your attitude, that you just want to maintain what you have and stay comfortable. You know what he said to me? He said, in five years, there will be 60 people sitting here reminiscing on the glory days and wondering where it all went wrong. And I said, Lord, that's harsh. You need to back that up with scripture. Honestly, I did. I thought that was harsh. And he said, turn to Matthew 25. And it did. And I read the parable of the talents. And the one who got one talent or one bag of gold, as it says here. Let me read it. What did they do with the one bag? They buried it. They kept it. They maintained it. They didn't risk losing it. It says, so take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who had 10 bags. For whoever has will be given more and what they, and they will have in abundance. Whoever doesn't have, this is a bit, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Do you see that? The one with one bag of gold, all they wanted to do was hold on to what they have because one bag was good enough. And God says, you know what, I'm going to take that one bag from them because they have shown me that they can't do anything with it. And I'm going to give it to somebody who at least will risk reproducing it. And I believe that's the word of the Lord for us today. That if we get too settled and stagnant and stale and too comfortable with what we have, because what we have is really good. God will say, you know what? I'm going to give it to somebody else who will increase it. And that's a challenge to my heart, believe me. And it's a challenge to all of us. Because I don't want to lose what I have. But I want to be obedient to him. God desires fruitfulness. God desires enlargement and growth. Remember Jesus cursed the fig tree? Why? Because it wasn't bearing fruit. And it shriveled up and died. John 15, Jesus says this, I am the vine, the father is the gardener. Look at what he says. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. He just cuts it off. He gets rid of it. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. I want, I'd rather be pruned than cut off. And maybe this is a wee bit of pruning for us this morning. 
that God would say, I will prune you. And don't mistake the two. Pruning is for greater fruitfulness. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Not just a little bit of fruit, much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. God's desire is that we would be a church that bears much fruit. In fact, the evidence of being connected to Jesus is fruitfulness. The evidence of having the Holy Spirit flowing among us is not the liver shiver or the tingles. It is fruitfulness. It is that we see reproduction. We see people come to faith. We see people rededicate their lives. We see growth in depth and in breadth. God's desire is fruitfulness. That we reproduce who we are and what we have. How do we do that? I don't mean physically, we're not going to have a biology lesson, but if you're not seeing the fruitfulness in your life that you want to see, if you're not seeing new life and growth, how do you see that? God tells his people through the prophet Isaiah, and it's not what you expect. Sing, barren woman, you who have never born a child, burst into song, shout for joy. You and who were never in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband, says the Lord. He says, do something to break the barrenness. Look at what God says through the prophet Isaiah. Sing, burst into song, shout for joy. In other words, what God is saying is this. Something coming from you will cause something to happen in you. Singing and shouting will cause a divine conception to be initiated within you that will bring forth new life. And I, this is not about everybody shouting, okay? That's not what this is about. But what he's saying is, I want you to do something. I want you to take a bold action that will break the barrenness of your life. Singing and shouting for joy seems so counterintuitive for this barren woman's condition. It seems insensitive. It seems almost cruel to say to somebody who's barren, I want you to sing and shout for joy. It should be, I want you to cry and sigh. I want you to to shout in anger. I want you to weep and mourn, but that's not what it says. It says, sing and shout and burst into song. It seems inappropriate and it would be entirely okay if the barren woman were to say, I don't feel like singing and shouting. I don't feel joyful. When or if my circumstances change, then I will sing, then I will shout, then I will worship. But there's no sign of change right now and I don't feel like singing and shouting for joy. And we all do that. I do that, will you do that? People will sometimes say to me, Craig, I don't feel like worshiping today. You know, if my heart's not really in it, I'm not going to do it. And I understand their integrity in that. What I would say is, why don't you do this? Why don't you sing until your heart's in it? David said this, praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your sins and heals your diseases, who wounds your life from the pit. You know what he's doing there? He's speaking to his own soul. He doesn't feel like praising God. He's saying, praise the Lord, my soul. I get up at five o'clock on a Sunday morning. You know what my first hour is doing? Preaching to myself. I'm stirring some, it's a bit like a car on a cold morning in the winter. It takes a few goes to get it going. I spend the first hour on a Sunday morning getting myself going. I put on worship, I pray, I, I, I just, I speak in tongues, whatever it is. My first hour before I even look at my sermon is just stirring myself up. And when I, that alarm goes up at five, the first words out of my mouth are not praise the Lord, hallelujah, I can't wait to preach this morning. It's not Lord is good, it's good Lord. And I have to stir up my soul. Oh, but I don't feel like giving. Do you know what people who are generous have learned? That you give and then the feeling comes. I don't feel like serving. Who does? But you know what people who serve have learned? That when you serve after you've done it, there's joy. It's a bit like the gym. You hate the thought of it, but after it, you're like, I'm glad I did it. You know, it's a bit like the couple who went to the therapist and they said, we are getting divorced. 
We, there's just all the intimacy is gone, all the love is gone, all the passion is gone. We just barely communicate. All the, all the feelings have gone that we used to have. We're getting divorced. And the therapist said, no problem at all, but come back to me in one month and I will sign off and tell the judge irreconcilable differences or whatever you want. But they said, here's what I want you to do for the next month. I want you to go and act like you did the first month you were together. I want you to go on dates. I want you to be intimate. I want you to cuddle. I want you to kiss. I want you to be courteous. I want you to open the door for her. I want you to do, and they said, we can't do, we don't feel. And he said, I don't care what you feel like. I want you to do that for the next month. And if you do that for the next month, come back and I'll sign off, no problem. And they did it, came, came back a month later, madly in love. You see, they were waiting for their feelings to determine their actions when actually your actions determine your feelings. We live in a world where everybody says, I feel. We live in a world where I feel. People used to say, I think. No, it's I feel. I catch myself doing, Lord, I just feel. I just feel, Lord, I just feel. I just feel annoyed at that person. I just feel, I just, I, I feel rejected. I, I feel dishonored. And I, I just hear God going, boo-hoo. Because <laughs> it's just feelings. We're not meant to live by feelings. We're meant to live by faith and the truth of the word of God and the character of God and who God. If you live your entire life by feelings, you are going to be a mess. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. My feelings are my firm foundation. No, they're not. Your feelings are all over the place. You can't live by feelings. We don't live by our feelings. So instead of allowing your feelings to control what you do, flip it and say, you know what? I'm going to start doing this thing until I feel like it. I don't feel like worshiping, but I'm going to worship until I feel like it. I don't feel like giving, but I'm going to give until I feel like it. I don't feel like serving, but I'm going to serve until I feel like it. If you're stuck, if you're barren, if you're low, if you're empty, the way to break that barrenness is not to wallow in your feelings, but to do something that is in the opposite spirit to those feelings, even though you don't feel like it. You never break barrenness by wallowing in barrenness. And you need to be deliberate and intentional about doing the opposite and keep doing it and keep doing it until your feelings catch up with your actions rather than waiting for your feelings to change. Notice it says sing, shout for joy. It's not a suggestion, it's a command. It's not good advice, it's a command with a promise at the end of verse one. Look at what it says, many are more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband, says the Lord. The sound coming from you, even if you don't feel like it, even if your circumstances don't look good, even if you feel stuck and discouraged and depressed, something coming from you, something released from you is going to change something within you. Your song will become a seed and your barrenness will be broken as you do something to break it, says the Lord. So sing and shout as a prophetic announcement that your current position is not your permanent condition. Sing and shout to declare to every demon from hell and every angel in heaven that where you are is not where you're staying. I know it's been this way for a long time, but it can change. But you have a part to play. Someone put it like this once. God doesn't give us tables and chairs. He gives us trees. And we're praying for tables and chairs and God send there's the trees. God is saying, what are you going to do to break the barrenness? Yes, I know your pain is great. Yes, I know things haven't worked out. Yes, I know you've been disappointed. You've been betrayed. You've been hurt. You've been rejected. You feel empty. You feel lonely. You're stuck in a cycle of sin and failure and struggle. And I know it's hard to be optimistic and I know you've heard all of this before and it just sounds like another motivational pep talk. God says, I know all of that, but this is not the final verdict over your life because this is not what I have written over your life. Don't write a, 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 a verdict over your life that is contrary to the script that God has written over your life. To the people hearing this 700 years before Jesus or 600 years before, this, Isaiah sounded like a nut job. 
These guys are in Babylon. They're contained. They're in exile. They're slaves. And Isaiah's coming along saying, Sing, shout, you're going to have loads of babies. Isaiah, go away. Get a life, you looper. Like that is what they looked at. It just it didn't make sense. And if it all makes sense up front, you probably don't need God. When God wants to do something great in you or through you, you will always look at your current situation, your current condition, your current resources, your current abilities, and you will go, that sounds ridiculous. Because I know me and I know that I can't do that. If you can do it, if it doesn't sound ridiculous, can I say to you, it's probably not God. It's just a good idea. And that's okay too. God shows up to Abraham as an old man and says, you're going to be a father of nations. God shows up to David, the shepherd boy, and says, you're going to be king. God shows up to Gideon and calls him a mighty warrior. Through Esther, you're going to save a nation. The disciples, you're going to feed 5,000. Hope church reached Craig Alvin and beyond with the gospel. Even think about planting a church. It doesn't make sense. Give, serve, love, lead, forgive, sacrifice. It doesn't make sense. It's not meant to make sense. If it makes sense, it's not probably God. Because you can just do it on your own. Your vision and the vision God gives you will always be greater than the resources you currently have so that you have to depend on him. If the vision matches what you have, it's not him. Because God's vision is always bigger than ours. And God says, all you see is barrenness, I see babies. So in the words of Britney Spears, sing, shout, and let it all out. Do something to break the cycle. Put a marker on the sand. Take a bold step. Do something to say, I am not staying like this. Fast. <laughs> Some of you nearly had a demon released right there when I said fast, <laughs> including myself. <coughs> Give, sing, shout, call, text, reach out, get prayer. Do something to break the barrenness over your life. Sing it until you mean it, sing it, until you see it. And so as I close, let me just ask, what's not working in your life the way it should? Some of you in your marriage have said, you know what, this is just how it's going to be. It's so far from what we dreamt it would be, but it's just how it's going to be. Some of you in your singleness have said, this is just how it's going to be. Some of you in your health have settled for a diagnosis. Some of you in your finances have just said, it's always going to be this way. We're always going to be broke. In your walk with God, you just say, I'm not like those other Christians. I'm not one who gets excited about God. In your job, I'll never get promoted. And we get so used to things being a certain way and the enemy robs us of joy and faith and hope and we lose our spark and we lose our song. And it takes something radical. It takes something counterintuitive. It takes something bold and brave to break the cycle. Because look what happens at the end of verse 1. God says fruitfulness is coming. Because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband, says the Lord. He says, you look at yourself and you see a barren, desolate widow. He says, I look at you and I see someone with children running all around them. In fact, you're going to have more children than those that you look at. And you're jealous of their situation. You see, when God shifts something in our lives that isn't right, he always does more than just make it right. When you're at minus five, God doesn't change things and bring you to zero. God takes you from minus five to ten. Remember Job? The Lord restored his fortunes and gave him twice as much. Zachariah says, I will restore twice as much to you. Joel says, I will repay to you for the years the locusts have eaten. You will have plenty. Instead of your shame, says Isaiah, you will receive a double portion. God says, you know what? You lost five pounds, here's 50. I'm more than making it up for what you've lost. Hope, church, we're not barren. 
please don't hear that. There is so much joy and life and fruitfulness. But there's going to be more. There's going to be more. Hope Church is eight years old in a week or so. It's a birthday. Hey, Hope, it's your birthday. We're going to party like it's your birthday. We're going to leave it there. You can be thankful for what you have while still believing God for more. Some of us think that if we want more, we're ungrateful. No, I am so deeply, 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 deeply grateful for what I have. But I'm still believing God for more. You see, God isn't angry when we want more. I think he's angry when we settle for less. And hope is eight years old in a a week or so. And God birthed this church eight years ago through a group of faithful, committed people who believed there was more. More to the church, more to the Christian life, more of the spirit, more than they had seen or experienced. It was a bold move. It was a painful move. It was a messy move. But labor is messy. But what is birthed is beautiful. And so we're eight years old. And in the Bible, do you know what the number eight signifies? New beginnings. Seven days in a week, day eight is a new beginning. Jesse brought seven sons to Samuel. Number eight, David, was a new beginning for Israel. Eight is a number of new beginnings. And as we turn eight, I think it's a time of new beginnings for hope. I believe it will be a time of conception and birthing new things. And I don't know what that looks like, but I do believe we're going to see people come to faith in Jesus at a much greater rate than we have seen. We're going to see new ministries birthed. We're going to see new outreaches. We're going to see new leaders raised up. We're going to see new staff come on board. We're going to see a new building. We're going to see a new congregation, possibly, as we think about planting another Hope Church, maybe other Hope Churches around the place. But this isn't just Hope Church. This is you personally. God wants to break barrenness over your life. Any place where things aren't working as they should, God wants to bring fruitfulness. When you're pregnant, what do you say? I'm expecting. Let me ask you, are you expecting? I would get you to turn to your neighbor and say, I'm expecting, but Some people might have a wee heart attack if they haven't been listening to the last minute or two. I'm expecting. Folks, I'm expecting. Next, in part two, I'll be telling you about stretch marks. That's what part two is, stretch marks. I promise you. If you look at verse two, you'll see that. But you know what I want to say today? I'm expecting. I'm expecting. I'm expecting great things from God. And I want to attempt great things for God. And I know that's your heart. Let me close. A number of years ago, I was at New Wine in, in Sligo, and there was a guy called Steve Morris speaking. He was an English guy who, who a few years before that, he had been on a short-term mission trip to South Africa, and they'd taken him into one of the townships, one of the most poor, deprived, destitute areas. And when he was in there, he was introduced to a 14-year-old girl who, when she was 12, she'd been sold as a prostitute by her auntie. And he talked to this little girl who for two years had been selling her body every day to every dirty scumbag who would pay for it. And he told her about the love of Jesus and how God loved her. And as he was leaving, she looked at him and she said, thank you, I would never know what real love was if you hadn't told me about Jesus. And he he, he got on on a plane and he came back to England and his heart was broken and he just was angry and he He just said, this isn't the way it should be. This isn't the way it's meant to be. Somebody's got to do something about this. Somebody needs to change this. This isn't the way God intended it to be. And he began to look into it and he began to research what it would take to build a a center, a school, a building for, for kids that age to take them out of that lifestyle. And the figure he got back was 40,000 pounds. And he began to think about the rich business friends that he could maybe approach and get some money. And he thought, if I can contact one or two of my rich business friends, I can maybe get 40,000 pounds. And as he was praying about, Lord, who will I contact? Who will I ask for 40,000 pounds? God said this, what have you got in your bank account? 
that wasn't what he wanted to hear. Because for the last two years, his wife and him had saved 2,000 pounds. It was their little buffer in case an emergency came up. It was a deposit for a house for their growing family. And he said, God, I've got 2,000 pounds. And God said, will you surrender that? And he wrestled and he talked to his wife. And in the end, they just said, if God's asking us to do it, we'll do it. And they gave their 2,000 pounds to one side. And the problem is that they're still 38,000 pounds short. And shortly after that, he was at the big new wine conference in England. And he was actually, he was just, he was speaking at the youth event for the week. And one morning, one of the main stage speakers got ill, had food poisoning or something from the night before and couldn't speak. And so the organizers were in a real dilemma. Who do we get to speak at the last minute on the main stage in front of 10,000 people? And they said, to Steve, Steve, will you leave the youth this morning? Somebody else can take that and will you come in and speak to the adults? And, and he said, yeah, sure. But I mean, all I can do is tell stories. You know I mean? I don't have much to give. Like you've got all these big speakers and big names. I'm going to be a disappointment. And they said, just come in and share your heart. And, and Steve Morris stood at the front and he began just to share about South Africa and his heart and what he had seen and how his heart had been broken and the little girl he had seen and the vision he had. And as, he's, as he's speaking, he, he, he sees somebody walking towards the front and he's distracted but he keeps going and the person comes up and, and sets something down on the platform and, and he, he, he glances down and it's, it's a 20 pound note and he keeps talking and, and somebody gets up at the back and walks to the front and, and sets down a 10 pound note and he keeps talking and then a little girl who's about seven or eight years old comes up and she puts down five pound coins and he's talking, and as he's talking, you can actually, I, I've seen the clip a, a number of years ago on YouTube, I don't know if it's still, as he's talking, people just keep coming up, and they just keep setting down money, and they keep setting down money, and you can just see he's distracted, and he's trying to speak, but he's just completely overwhelmed by what's happening, as people just keep setting down money in front of him. By lunchtime that day, he had 30,400 pounds. A businessman then handed him a check for £5,000. And by the end of the day, he had £38,000. When he added this to his own 2000 he had the full 40000 that he needed. All because he was willing to make a bold move. He was willing to sacrifice what he had. He was willing to say, God, what I look like or what I have looks barren and empty. It looks useless, but God, I'm willing to give you that. Do what you want with it. And today there's a school and a house for young people like that little girl to stop them being trafficked. But it all began with him making a bold move in faith. What's the move God's asking you to make? Let's pray together as the worship team come up. Let's just let the Spirit take the word this morning and speak to each of us. Holy Spirit. Break barrenness in our lives and bring fruitfulness to our lives and to our church. We are believing you for more. Not because we're ungrateful for what we have, we are so thankful. So thankful, but because you have more. So, Lord, we lay whatever it is at your feet, and we trust that you will take it and you will do something great with it, not because we're great, but because you're a great. Folks, I stand.